Hello, it's Duncan. If you watched any of my previous videos, then you will probably know that I practice test-driven development. To some extent, just having to write tests makes our code better. But what the hell, we might as well run them to find out if things actually work. If we're going to run the tests, then waiting for them is just a drag. When I'm coding, I'll often run the tests more than once a minute. And if they take longer than a second or so, then they interrupt my flow and hurt my productivity. Introducing test containers last episode made it about just how much I hate slow tests. So this week, I'm going to look at techniques for keeping our inner loop as short as possible. My goodness, that's quite something. We left the last episode with two problems. One of which is that we occasionally find time zones for this test that aren't supported by the version of Postgres that we're running in test containers. So here we're failing because, ah, here it is. It looks like Alpine Linux hasn't got time zone support for AET, whatever that is. A couple of people pointed out in the comments that I could just change the container image to one that did support it. And Jonathan Kohlberg pointed out that I could be using the same container as I'm using in Docker Compose. So if we find this and see that here we are using Postgres 15.2, we could take that and use it as our image name here and run the tests. And everything should be fine. Now, granted, it was a failure with random data, so that's not a very good demonstration but I think the theory is sound. The other problem is just the amount of time it takes to run the tests with test containers. So our total test run time here says it's two and a half seconds, basically. And this test, which is DB items tests, here is taking 1.74 seconds of that. Now we see later that in fact, I'm running the tests in parallel, so it's not quite that stark. But if I was to go back to the version before test containers, that's this one here, we'll check out that revision and we'll just force a checkout, I think. Now when we run the tests, they're over and under a second. This is saying 973 milliseconds. Now then, the observant amongst you will note that if I run that again, 1001, 1002. Well, I reckon I got to at least 1002, so two seconds before the test passed, but the test runner is claiming 714 milliseconds. So something odd is going on, and I think today let's try and understand what that is. The first thing to look at is what we're actually running. So if I look at this all in Gilded Rose test, that's what we're running. And we say, edit, here's the run configuration. There's its name. We're running with Java 21, it has a class path. There are a couple of things we're setting here. We're telling Duke not to show its logo or its tips with some system properties. Now it's not clear from here actually, but we run this test not with Gradle, but with IntelliJ. What does that mean? Well, if I look at settings, here they are, make it a bit bigger. And you can see here that under our build tools Gradle, we're saying build and run using Gradle, but run tests using IntelliJ. Now, not long ago, IntelliJ was able to build whole projects itself, as well as run the tests. And this used to say build and run tests using, but it seems to have declared bankruptcy on the idea of actually building a whole project itself. So these days the build will always be Gradle, but we may run tests just using IntelliJ. This is not the default, by the way. My experience in the past has been that running tests using IntelliJ has been slightly faster than Gradle, but let's see whether that's still true. I should say that this all in Gilded Rose test came about by going to test here and saying, run all tests there. And then adding in the system properties. So what is being run if we ask IntelliJ to run the tests? Well, it's hidden up the top here. Let's have a look. I'm gonna take that whole line and create a new scratch file. And let's have a look. My goodness, that's quite something. You can see that we're running Java 21 as configured by JNV. Here we have our system settings. I think this is enabling assertions. We're setting another property here, something around a test cyclic buffer size. I guess that's the size of the output window in something. It's running a Java agent, two Java agents. It's setting some Kotlin X coroutine system properties. My goodness. It's got a huge class path here. And then finally down here, we've got com IntelliJ RT JUnit JUnit starter. Telling the IDE version that it wants to use JUnit 5 and some other parameters that I don't understand. But I think we can probably take a guess that this JUnit starter is going to run JUnit tests having configured them to communicate with the IDE in some way over some sort of socket and or temp files. So that when we run, 
we see a real-time view. What about if we run through Gradle? Well, I'm going to change this to Gradle. OK, and now again, I'm going to right click here and say run tests. There they go. Now that says they took three seconds to run and you can see we get a little elephant icon in comparison to the J unit icon. So we can see from the icons whether they're being run by IntelliJ or Gradle. Now we can see in the output from this one that we've seen the Gradle build. So we're seeing all the tasks and whether they're up to date. And then when the test is run after the test class has been compiled, we're seeing the output. I'm just going to run that again. And you can see that it claims to be taking three seconds compared to the IntelliJ version, which claims to be taking one second, but appears actually to be taking at least two or three. Although maybe some of that is the Gradle build that has to happen before IntelliJ gets in to run the tests. Just going to pin this one and now run the IntelliJ one. OK, looking at them side by side, this is the Gradle version. You can see it claims to take three seconds or so, including the Gradle build, although pretty much all of that is up to date. We go down the bottom. Gradle claims that it built in two seconds, which seems a bit dubious to me. But three seconds, 1001, 1002, 1003, appears to be about right to me. In this case, it says it runs in 930 milliseconds. Let's have a go. 1001, 1002, 1003. Well, I think the IntelliJ runner is quicker. It appears to take about two seconds as opposed to about three seconds. One thing I have noticed, you see here it says ignored 21 of 155 tests. We'll come to why that is in a minute. This says 21, but if I run it again, that's OK. Ah, there we go, ignored 19 of 155 tests. And you can see here that delete items browser tests, it claims to have run here, although they were actually skipped at this level. It's a little bit worrying that the test runner doesn't seem to be able to count consistently, but in practice it only seems to be like this, where it's skipping the actual tests but giving a tick for the class. So that notwithstanding, I tend to prefer the IntelliJ runner as it does appear to run the tests quicker, although the pre-building with Gradle is hidden from us. I do want to look at Gradle running the tests a bit more though, so let's give ourselves a terminal window. IntelliJ was invoking the test task from its Gradle runner, so that's dot slash Gradle W test. Let's see what happens when we run that. Well, again, it claimed to run in two seconds, but I smell a rat. Also, what it was running flash before our eyes, we can fix that with minus minus console equals plane. This time it claims less than a second, but you'll see the test was up to date. Why is that? Well, it's because we haven't changed any sources, so it knows it doesn't have to run the tests. The easiest way to fix that is to clean beforehand. So if we rerun that, but with a clean test, it will clear out the output directories, build everything, but that's slow. And finally run the test in 14 seconds. So clean is undesirable if we want quick tests. So if Gradle is not running the tests if it doesn't think it has to, how is IntelliJ persuading it? Well, I think the answer is probably that it's running not clean test, but minus minus rerun task. OK, not that. Oh, it's actually minus minus rerun. And there you go. You can see that the source tasks were all up to date, but we still ran the test. Still claims to be two seconds though, and I still smell a rat. So let's use the power of Unix. So let's take that and rerun it with time. So here is the output from time, and it says in total that took 2.77 seconds. That feels a little more realistic to me. It's interesting though that's all quicker than IntelliJ's three seconds here. I don't know quite what's going on there. I'll give it another little go. So it's saying three seconds, and in terms of all time, 1001, 1002. Well, I think that might actually have been less than three seconds to run, but this one, 1001, 1002, generally feels quicker to me. So again, my default is to use the built-in IntelliJ runner rather than the Gradle one. So let's go back here and change that back to IntelliJ. Let's take the opportunity to look at some of the other tricks we use to make these tests fast. The first and easiest is just not to run some tests. So, for example, browser tests are always slow because they fire up browsers. Things like add item are tested in several ways. So we have this acceptance contract that 
runs up an app and then has some tests about what should happen when you add item and add item, no date, and so on. And then we have implementations of that contract, which are tests themselves, which define how to actually add an item in different ways. And so this add item acceptance contract is implemented by add items via HTTP, add items directly, and add items via a browser. And the add item browser tests is only enabled if a system property named run browser tests has the value true. Now, the default test configuration doesn't have that system property set, so it's skipped here. And you see, in fact, there's a little bit of diagnostic system property run browser test does not exist. We can still, though, run these tests directly. La, 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 la. And when I do, you can see why I don't run them as part of the normal test runs. Or we can have a test configuration, and it's this one here, browser tests. And in here, if I edit that, you'll see that that does set a system property run browser test is true. So if I want to run all the browser tests, I can do it by running that run configuration. Oh, and they are popping up a browser. You can see from here that this run configuration runs all the other tests as well, because they're not disabled by this property existing. So system properties, and we can also use environment variables, are a nice easy way to segment our tests if they're all living in one Gradle module. I have another run configuration, which is really all. Let's have a look at that. And you can see here that that sets another two system properties. One is run slow tests and one is run external tests. And I suppose really I should set minus D run browser tests in here as well. So external tests and slow tests are another partitioning of our test space. If I run this, you'll see that, oh, browser pops up. That's all good. But that's run most things, except it turns out fetch data. Let's have a look at that. And fetch data is a test that is just plain disabled. We can still run it directly, but it will never be included in any suites. And I quite often use JUnit like this just to create little utilities that we can run via IntelliJ rather than having a main method. What else is disabled? Our parallel map failure mode tests. Let's have a look. These are, oh, well, it turns out we have run benchmark tests is yet another of our all tests. So in fact, let's take that thing and add it to our really all minus d run benchmark tests equals true and now if we were to run that you can see our whole test suite takes really quite a long time because things like parallel map tests are doing benchmarking and in fact lots of repetitions in order that we get good results in addition down here value of tests let's look at that this is run external tests and it's calling up to the value of servers actually a lot of times here to show how reliable or unreliable they are. And again, this is another test where I might want to run it sometimes, but it's not giving me test-driven design feedback. It's not telling us when our code is broken. And you can see here, in fact, because we had this repeated test, something here is ticking up hundreds of tests, our parallel map tests. Again, so that's running here, Coroon's team's delay version, and our repetition one of 100, so this is a repeated test. Ah, we do seem to have finished. So our total test suite we ignored two actually disabled tests. We ran 763 tests, quite a few of those through repeated test, and the entire suite takes just over two minutes. Now, that would probably be fine for a continuous integration build, but I don't want to wait two minutes to see whether the regular expression is correct in a piece of code I'm developing right now. So back to our normal tests, that's all in gilded rows, but not really all. There we are, we're at 968 milliseconds. I'm just gonna run that again and watch the way the tests appear. That was pretty quick, I don't know whether you noticed, but there was actually more than one test running at once. How is that? Well, here in source test Java, in the resources, we have a JUnit platform properties file. And in there, there are some settings that configure JUnit. And in particular, this parallel enabled is true. If I wasn't to set that and run all our tests, you can see that was a little bit slower. I'll run it again just to check. Yes, consistently over a second as opposed to consistently around 900 milliseconds. So these settings, the first one here, if parallel enabled is true, then JUnit will look at these other parallel properties in order to work out how you want to parallelize things. This parallel mode default affects the parallelism of the tests in a class. This same thread means I want to use one thread in the class so there will be no parallelism. The parallel mode classes, though, is parallelism between the test classes. And by saying concurrent here, it will potentially run each one of these sets of tests in parallel with each other. 
this test and this test may be running at the same time, but this method and this method will not be running at the same time. And the final property here, dynamic, is how JUnit chooses the number of threads to start. Dynamic is, I think, the default, and it chooses as many threads as there are available processes. I think maybe if our tests are I.O. bound, then we might get more speed by giving it more threads. Here's the documentation. Let's make it fixed and then set whatever this is. So let's take that. And back here was a fixed. And parallelism equals 32 as a number. Let's try it. Run all the tests. And again. And well, my feeling is that that's shaved a few tens of milliseconds off, but I'd have to measure properly to be sure. If you're after fast test runs, it's worth playing with these and experimenting again every so often. Running tests in parallel has a couple of consequences as well as normally making things quicker. One is that these numbers won't necessarily add up because some of these times will be happening in parallel. Another is that speeding up any one individual test may not make much of a difference, but that will depend on when the slow test is run. At the moment, these are sorted alphabetically. Let's have a look for the slow tests. DB items test is taking 371. Some of these are basically not taking any time at all, apparently. So it would be interesting to see how much effect the DB items test actually has on the whole test time. Let's just go to there and let's just disable this test and rerun everything. A couple of times of good luck. Okay. So removing a test that took, say, 300 milliseconds has removed maybe something like 100 milliseconds from our test run time. If we switch off the alphabetic ordering, and sweeps always on top, and run. Now I think what we're seeing here is the order in which the tests are run, or started, or the results received. It's a shame that the DB items test isn't started first of all, because that's the long running one, and if we could start it right at the beginning, then it could be chuntering away while everything else is running. That would seem to give us our best chance of a fast test suite, but I don't know any way of influencing the order in which JUnit collects these classes to test. I don't even know actually whether it's stable or not. And the final consequence of running tests in parallel is that if we have a shared resource like a database, we may have problems with two tests accessing the database at the same time, especially if one of them comes along like this one and clears it out. To solve that problem, JUnit has this resource lock annotation, which basically takes a string to sort of lock on, and any two tests with the resource lock with the same string won't be run at the same time. We've deleted another database test recently, so I don't know whether there is one of these. Let's have a look. Uh, we want to look in the entire project. Oh, and no, this appears to be the only place. I do just wonder whether things might be quicker if I removed it. Let's have a look. Ah, uh, no. So I'm inclined to leave that in, so at least I remember how to solve that problem for other database tests. Good. One last thing before I go, normally when I make these videos, you see test run like this, where the progress bar and the test runner doesn't pop up. I get a lot of questions about that, and that test runner was written for me by Dmitry Kandilov. You can see here, enable plugin for Duncan. He uses his live plugin plugin, which I think is that thing there. Yes, there you go. So here's the test notification and the Kotlin code that interacts with IntelliJ to make it work. If you'd like that for yourself, then details are in the show notes below this video. So shout out to Dimitri for that. And if you have any problem that might be solved by an IntelliJ plugin, I think he might write it for you in exchange for money. Talking of money, you could spend some to attend the workshop that Nat Price and I are running at Kotlin Conf in Copenhagen in May. If you've enjoyed this and you're not subscribed, well, it's not too late. When this is published, there will still be 18 subscribing days before Christmas. In any case, please just click that like button because it will help other people find this content. And if you've enjoyed this, then I think you'll like the book that I wrote in that price called Java to Kotlin Refactoring Guidebook, details of which are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching.